Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this webinar on the future of medical diagnostics and technology. I am Dr. Archisman Mahapatra, Executive Director, Grid Council, your moderator for the day. Through some engaging insights from our esteemed panelists today, we shall understand how the future of diagnostics is being shaped with the increasing use of technology. As we see it, diagnostics are evolving rapidly with the use of technology, and of course, that goes hand in hand with the increasing needs for healthcare. Now, moving in the direction of automation powered by artificial intelligence and machine learning, and of course, data analytics, technology assures precision and pace, especially when we look to the future of diagnostics. The pandemic, of course, has proven that the demand for laboratory testing and diagnostics will keep on growing. In fact, the Indian diagnostic industry has been valued at an INR uh, of about 675 billion. And this has been projected to keep on increasing at the rate of 10% per annum for the next five years. The need of the R, of course, is investment in the most competent technology and infrastructure that will aid pathologists in quicker and more accurate diagnosis. With the right technological investments and practices in place, diagnostics and healthcare will reach the projected transformations successfully, and that's what we hope for. To discuss this, role, this particular roadmap of technology transformation in diagnostics and the various driving factors around it, we are organizing RISE, an exclusive webinar brought to you by Online India. Uh, it's India's leading digital payments company and Economic Times Health World, that is ethealthworld.com. And I take the pleasure in introducing our panelists for the day. We have Dr. Harsh Mahajan, Sir is the founder, director, and chief radiologist, Mahajan Imaging. He is an eminent radiologist and a pioneer in the field of medical resonance imaging in India and abroad. Sir has received several accolades in the national and international space and plays pivotal roles in several committees of impact. Welcome, sir. Next, we have Mr. Dinesh Chauhan. He is the chief executive officer for diagnostics. He is a microbiologist who has been in the leading business roles in the diagnostic industry for more than 25 years now. At Core Diagnostics, he is focusing on high-end, next-generation diagnostics that could be used for disease stratification and therapy selection. Welcome, sir. Next, we have uh, Mr. Saugar Chatterjee. He is the CEO of Apollo Preventive Health Check. He shines in multiple roles, that of a healthcare strategist and a leadership mentor. Is a thought leader when it comes to the issues of the healthcare industry in India and beyond. And it's very easy to discover his writings on the internet. Welcome, sir. Pleasure. Pleasure, Dr. Mahabad. Next, we have Dr. Arjun Dang, CEO of the highly acclaimed Dr. Dang's lab in Delhi NCR. He's an MD in pathology with advanced specialization in liver pathology from King's College Hospital, London. He has been widely recognized and awarded for innovations during the COVID-19 pandemic. He's also the winner of the Business World 40 Under 40 in healthcare. He, he handles strategy, operations, patient experience, and staff trainings at Dr. Tanks. Welcome, sir. And then we have Mr. Ramesh Narasimhan, CEO, Wallline India, which is a leader in the payments industry in India and globally. He has over 32 years of uh, leadership roles in several uh, businesses, and he has built businesses right from uh, scratch and then scaled up across verticals and geographies. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Thank you. So, once again, Arti, welcome to all the panelists, and uh, let's get the discussion started. Uh, Mr. Ramesh, I'll come to you. Let's start this discussion with your inputs. As we know, the role of technology is rapidly evolving in the medical diagnostics industry. And uh, you have been very active in this uh, industry. So I would request you to give an overview uh, on this, especially on how digitization is revolutionizing the consumer experience and behavior, and what growth triggers you see that exist that would drive the digital diagnostics to the next level. Thank you, Dr. Mahapatra, and, and uh, you know, uh, hello and welcome to my fellow panelists. Um, it's a great question because digitization is all pervasive in our lives today, um, whether it be uh, ordering things at home or uh, the education, uh, you know, you know, or even doctors' consultations, and you take everything, payments, everywhere. Digitization is the order of the day, um, and and 
you know the the pandemic has ensured uh, you know many of the services that we are used to have now become digitized and you know as a whole we are also very comfortable with it and and we are you know leveraging uh, as it drives a lot of efficiency uh, digitization does do that now coming specifically to question on what are the triggers that exist that can drive digital diagnostics to the next level i see two triggers and the first one i see essentially has to do with data standardization right i mean you have uh, you know as i said the rise in uh, digitization digital diagnosis prescriptions is all revolutionizing uh, you know patient experience you know by providing very convenient and personalized approach uh, regardless of location when you could during the pandemic we have all done that we've been there we've done that uh, you know had a uh, discussion with doctor diagnosing our uh, you know you know whatever healthcare condition we have uh and this has happened because of the stress on medical services because of covid-19 uh, we started using uh, you know online channels to book appointments uh, we had uh, you know uh, uh, diagnostic line come to our home collect the sample and then publish the results to us online and also doctors prescribing medicines online right so now when you have all these things it's very important that for these services to scale up and be interoperable it is necessary to establish standards for a unified digital health system right and and the government unveiled something called the national digital health mission it's a right step in the direction as we start to live, as we start as india begins to liberate these things in a digital format right and 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 you have to do essentially a uh, standardized on formats that can simplify access to data across public private you know hospitals healthcare clinics diagnostic centers uh, you know and and with suitable data protocols and standardized formats electronic health records can be migrated across various health touch points right uh, ensuring that doctors have access to the right diagnostic data to be able to provide uh, timely and and care to the patient and and if you look at it india as a country we've done some of these things at a massive scale uh, you know the first one if you look at it is aadhar itself which is the backbone of some of these things that we are talking about right today we can say that more than uh, you know 1.2 billion people have aadhar records in india which we have leveraged uh, to set up a wonderful platform called covid uh, you know and and it works to deliver uh, the you know especially in the era of covid pandemic uh, you know to deliver uh, reminders to you to take your Uh, those to deliver help you book an appointment and to also i was pleasantly surprised i received the sms saying you are ready for booster shot now and i actually went and took the booster uh, this last week and you know getting this platform ready is probably one of the biggest things that we could have done as a country and the platform works right brilliant so this is one thing that we've done on uh, at scale right and then if you take uh, things like fast tag today you know all of us when we drive down to work we used to play multiple toll booths money now you have a single standardized fast tag that you just drive through right so when you standardize uh, you know data standard is very important for us to build scale and make it efficient and um, you know make it easy for people to avail those services it payments itself i mean you know credit cards and debit cards were the privilege of the people who had access to banking today you have upi and you have everybody who can access this to payments the person i live in mumbai and the person who comes to deliver you know eggs and bread in the evening says sir aap upi mein pay kar do you know whatever name you call them google pay did them which means now he has access to a bank account and he is able to take payments electronically so you know we've seen this revolution happen in front of our eyes and that's why data standardization is important and along with it especially uh, any data for that matter you know it's important that we secure this data you know and so data protection data security individuals medical history these are not to be you know publicly made available it's supposed to be secure uh, you know stored can be only accessed by uh, you know professionals who need to access it to you know like the healthcare professional or a doctor to be able to give uh you know the right diagnosis similarly so so it's important that we gain the confidence of all stakeholders uh, whether it be be as citizens or patients medical fraternity government 
uh, and even support ecosystem like insurance or infrastructure providers right all these people are important stakeholders in this. and this is what i think is a very important trigger which which is data standardization right the second one which i'll talk talk about again from a you know being from the non medical fraternity um, you know talk about how um, you know these delivery mechanisms you know are are coming into play for the enhanced reach and convenience right um, you know today sample collection is done at the door steps right um, and the good part is uh, you know the, the laboratories are able to even collect money at the store door step thanks to digital payments right uh, but really as you go forward uh, you know the technology like drones which will come in and revolutionize how we can deliver uh, medical services in remote locations in our country right um, or collection of samples this is one uh, that can that, that can take us to the next level in terms of our, you know being able to uh, provide medical services to far flung areas right how can we provide you know some kind of you know using the bandwidth that we have today on a mobile phones can we provide the ability for a citizen to get medical advice from a doctor in a different city which is already happening but needs to be scaled up again right and lastly if you ask me from a technology perspective the other trigger could be uh, wearables you know today we all have watches that no longer are watches a watch is now you know a, a, a device that collects a lot of data though a lot of us still wear watches as a jewelry piece or something like that to tell us the time right but watches or wearables is the next uh, thing that will i think be able to collect a lot of data and with the advent of 5g uh, and what is called as iot uh, you know internet of things it will be i think this whole industry of collection of data diagnosis medical industry will one of be the, will be one of the big industries to be uh, getting will will we'll see a benefit of you know data which is coming directly from um you know the, the the patient and be able to provide much uh, you know greater uh, you know much better access to uh, real time data to provide the right diagnostics so at a very high level that's how i look at it dr mahapatra but there are experts on the panel who probably decode and tell you um, you know how to use the data and, and and make the best use of it thank you uh, mr narasimhan you touched upon several aspects of it and of course this triggers a very wide discussions now now on that we have to interact with the panelists i would now go to uh, dr mahajan sir you have been in the industry for so many years you have seen it evolve now when the covid 19 shocker came to us we always thought that possibly maybe the system has the resilience or not to handle this kind of a uh, calamity but of course this is the system has come out winning so it has been resilient and at the same time has been has shown the potential for rapid scale up as uh, uh, mr narasimhan was also mentioning we the covid experience the rapid scale up of the vaccination for covid uh, has been exceptional we have not only ensured that tests are available but tests have not penetrated so contactless sort of uh, uh, sample collection and delivery to the patients now of course there are learnings coming out of it so what learnings do you see that have emerged from this pandemic experience and especially that the diagnostic service providers should notice and take forward and if needed even further improve upon thank you very much uh, archaspan for having me on this uh, panel and as has been said by ramesh uh, and you yourself what this pandemic taught us is that we have the resilience we have the capability we have the ability and we have uh, the muscle which maybe we were not aware of to scale up to grow and at the same time to provide and keep providing quality with this rapid scale up that happened also what the pandemic showed and showed very well something which people believed and we may be in the industry and the government on its side believed could never happen that the public and the private sector can work hand in hand can strengthen each other to achieve the goals that the country needs to achieve targets that the country very direly required and uh, 
because we've been able to achieve this is why we are in a relatively comfortable situation at the present point of time where we saw that from a handful of labs capable of doing rt pcr testing the gold standard i mean now i think even in the rural areas they know that there's something like rt pcr which actually molecular diagnostics was thought to be the very highest end of lab diagnosis today there are thousands of labs in this country which are able to do it from a few hundred tests that we were capable of in april may of uh, 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic today we can easily scale up to 2 and a half 3 million and we would still have balance capacity left in the uh, system that is as far as uh, the pathology labs went also there was not a single rt pcr test that was being indigenously manufactured in 2020 we saw that the medtech sector rose to the occasion and today we have nearly 150 accredited units in the country which manufacture rt pcr and other allied tests something which uh, you know possibly if you ask me in january 2020 most people would have said hey it's just not possible but we found that within our own system our entrepreneurs our startups are established Uh, uh you know uh, uh, labs and uh, uh, you know medtech companies found that innate capability and today not only do we make in india for india but we are exporting to the west at the same time let me talk also of the textile industry which not a single you know quality uh, uh, mask let alone a full ppe kit was manufactured in the country today it's a 1 billion dollar industry and maybe more and we export to other parts of the world had this not happened you would not have had the you know uh, 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 people from labs coming wearing rt pcr outside your home coming into your home and picking up a sample it would just not have been possible you would have had to go to the labs where with the deficiency of ppe kits that same person could have taken 100 samples uh, uh, 80 samples a day instead of being able to go to 25 different locations where a new ppe kit 25 times and then be able to collect your sample then let me talk also about genome sequencing you know which again there were just a few labs in the country both in the private sector we have uh, 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 dr dinesh here from core labs who had the capability uh, at our own margin imaging we were capable of doing it but there were a handful and mostly doing genome sequencing for cancer these have now transformed into labs and and a large number of them in the government sector which are capable of doing next genome sequencing for determining whether there is any change happening in the virus from the wuhan virus to the alpha to the delta to the omicron it's possible only because we have next genome sequencing uh, here and insecog a uh, 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 collaborative set up by the government has 38 labs from the government sector six labs from the private sector and and proudly we say that we are one of them uh, and so if it is from omicron it is becoming omicron uh, dot 2 dot 12 dot 1 or some other change whether for the better or the worse whether it's going to be more virulent or more contagious that can be known only if you do next gen sequencing and here also the countries 
capability has risen many fold talking about my own personal field radiology and we know that both the chest x-ray as well as in the moderately severe and severe cases the chest ct scan was very essential to be able to know before things went bad before someone needed to be put on a ventilator that can we do something so that he doesn't go on a ventilator there again and here not only our radiologists our uh, you know pathologists uh, rose to the occasion but even think of the service engineers you know who were going into covid hospitals because something went wrong with a ct scanner or with the rt pcr machine or with some other system which was in use an x ray machine because not only were they being used but they were being abused used round the clock and so things failed and even these engineers despite you know uh, uh, what their parents may be telling them mostly young that why do you need to go but i can tell you the industry as a whole not only the diagnostics service providers the hospital service providers but the medtech industry the startup industry all rose to the occasion and again a point about what ramesh said digitization in radiology we've always been digital in lab medicine digitization happened years ago and this really helped even the whatsapp which you know when someone puts you in a group you say what the hell another one but during the pandemic they were taking videos off the monitors and radiologists sitting at home were able to write out the reports and send them back and we know the ct value on uh, 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 you know a number was very very helpful in differentiating mild disease from moderate and severe disease and hence determining whether a patient needs to go to a hospital or can be treated at home you would see the switch that happened in the beginning when the pandemic started even those who were asymptomatic those with mild disease were being admitted in hospitals whereas in in the second wave when we had the delta it was only the serious whose oxygen levels fell whose ct scan showed that there was significant disease who were being admitted and and so we've seen this transition even in treatment happening and then the use of telemedicine now credit to the government that in march of 2020 they came out with the draft regulation before that you know it was it was illegal to practice telemedicine in this country and that helped especially during the second wave when you know hospital bed beds became scarce were reserved only for the serious patients who required oxygen or icu care here telemedicine played a major role and uh, uh, you know to be able to provide home care home care companies came up so it wasn't just the diagnostics industry the entire therapeutics industry you know being able to provide care at home has come into its own and the learning if you ask me has been that we have the capability learning for telemedicine has been that for doctors like me and other physicians that even if you are not able to encounter the patient keep your hand on the patient here through a stethoscope using the tools that you have we are convinced now that even significant illness can be treated mild disease can be treated very definitely remotely and for the patient also since there was no choice on both sides they have also realized that we can actually be treated through telemedicine and you see so many startups coming up someone that i am associated with meradoc worked very well during the pandemic and worked free of charge and you you have to believe me when i say that many doctors worked free of charge providing their expertise online 
and not charging because if you remember a prescription was a must for you to go and get an rt pcr test done so that has been a learning also the fact that you can now test at home you know the home kits that have come into their own may not be as accurate as uh, a rt pcr test but if someone has significant disease has significant uh, uh, viral load then these tests are helpful the pain has been that those same prescriptions were floating around on the uh, uh, on whatsapp and many people were self uh, 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 treating and getting tests done which were not necessary getting ct scans done which were not necessary and so many times we had to actually uh, argue with people where the whole family would come to get a ct scan done young children with uh, uh, hardly any symptoms and and so that has been a bain self prescription and using that same prescription without actually talking to the doctor has been a bain and these are issues that we will have to overcome as as we go forward but there have been huge learnings the major the, the major thing being that india is capable that the public cooperated as much because remember if you have disease and you are going around in the community you will spread it and so there was self discipline also shown people took government notifications and government advice at face value despite the fact that at times we tend to be very nonchalant about it but during this pandemic we found that we were a reasonably disciplined lot and also for the medical fraternity different ways of diagnosing different ways of treating which will i think lead in the future in the non pandemic world to use of telemedicine to provide access to far flung areas expansion scaling up of diagnostic services in tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 towns and cities so access provided with quality of course one uh, uh, a negative that we found was that in every state in every district you had to go separately seek permissions and that's something i think that needs to be rectified where if the central government mandates something then at every individual level permissions should not be sought and there should not be because that delays the entire process and also uh, makes it non uniform we saw states which did very well and we saw others which didn't do so well uh, during the pandemic so we have to learn from each other <clears throat> and just as icmr became you know the central agency which was giving guidelines i think that should continue even in the future when we talk of infective disease or non infective disease be it cancer be it heart disease be it uh, you know stroke or what have you so there have been huge learnings and really i think what may have taken 10 or 15 years for transformation in healthcare for digitization in healthcare for new trends Uh, emerging in healthcare has been uh, uh, shrunken into two two and a half years and ai someone i think uh, arjun is going to talk about that so i won't delve into that thank you very much thank you uh, dr mahajan uh, while narrating the surge preparedness and response in india to the pandemic you touched upon issues which were cross cutting so not just the whole of government the whole of society the whole of industry and of course uh, many many sparks uh, with many promising sparks and inherent strengths that we have in our uh, approach to disease and discipline have been uncovered so people have risen to the occasion and that's been like across uh, different stakeholder constituencies so a very fantastic uh, elaboration of the learning sir and now as we uh, move on with the discourse there are elements that you mentioned and uh, some some have uh, Uh, been uh, very validated for example the technology front in diagnostics and uh, some startups and entrepreneurial skills uh, have also been uh, established in the country one thing that i observe is the emergence of ai ml so artificial intelligence and machine learning and that has also been adapted to the diagnostic front so 
So, uh, Dr. Arjun, I'd like to request you to reflect on this. Like, how do you see that AIML and technology is transforming diagnostics? And uh, how is this unfolding? And do you see any particular challenges and opportunities uh, going forward? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahapatra, for that question. And also, big thanks to ET Health World for having me on this panel, very prestigious panel that has such stalwarts in healthcare and other industries and such eminent speakers. Absolute pleasure to be here. Yes, so the way that I see adoption of tech and AI unfold in healthcare, so it's, it's very clear that it is going to increase accessibility. It is going to lead to more collaboration in the healthcare fraternity itself. And ultimately, it's going to lead to better healthcare being provided and betterment of the overall health of the nation. So that in a nutshell is see how I see it unfolding, but it is not going to be a destination that we can reach. It's probably going to be a journey and an uphill one with a handful of challenges and abundant opportunities on the way. And when we speak about these challenges, what I actually feel that obviously, like what Dr. Mahajan sir was saying, that COVID gave all of us a push and it was the still silver lining in the dark cloud that made us realize that actually what tech can do, not only to scale, but also to keep delivering that precision and accuracy in our reports and how it actually helped us. But for a majority of India, where healthcare is mostly fragmented and in the unorganized sector, to adopt and adapt to technology is actually like changing the wheel of a moving car. So it is going to have challenges, but the one key factor that we can look at while doing this is very effective and clear communication of the vision to your team. So once the team understands that there is a, a tech piece to diagnostics that at the end of the day is going to give that value add to the patient, then the entire team is on board and that wheel of the moving car can easily be changed. So that is one challenge, especially in smaller organizations and, and, uh, and in a country like ours. The second phase where I see is now we have radiology that is leaps and bounds ahead in AI and ML. And also compared to pathology, we see a lot of more work being done in radiology. But I see one challenge there that for a doctor, a trained doctor who is an MBBS or an MD in radiology, for them actually to understand AI, although we, we do have a lot of people doing great work, but actually to carve out these kind of doctors from people who've done their education and training um, in the regular MD radiology field, I think that is a challenge. And to find doctors who are, who are adept and understand both the tech side and the subject also, I think that is something that requires a lot of focus on training, education, skilling, and then also encouraging these doctors to further take that path and build teams to do something different and something niche. Again, another thing that I see that would be a challenge would be the huge amount of data that we have. The different formats, what, what we were also discussing earlier and Mr. Ramesh had mentioned, was that this data being in different formats. So this data integrity that we need, this uniformity across different uh, different platforms or different formats that is there, to have them in a uniform way will be a challenge, not only because of the fact that they are in different formats, but also because of regulations, because of data regulations, data sharing, patient consent, etc. So that would again be another challenge that we have. And obviously, the third and the most obvious one would be the dependence on the machine itself. When we talk about tech and when we talk about AIML, like I still remember that during COVID, there was one late evening when suddenly WhatsApp wasn't turning on. And it was actually disastrous because in those 15, 20 minutes, I see some 10 SMSs that how is this going to work and that going to work. So dependency is huge. So, so at the end of the day, that empathy and trust between a doctor and a patient, when you actually hold the pulse of a patient and look, look them in the eye is something that should not go missing. And I pray that doesn't. 
and obviously coming to the opportunities now i think i think no time and words are enough to actually convey what a great opportunity it is for the sector and for professionals like us because for a uh, for a country like india and what has been spoken before also the scale and the last mile delivery that we need to reach there is no other way but to leverage tech to have have this in the rural uh, rural areas also have accessible quality affordable healthcare for all the only way is to reach through tech uh, another another one that uh, that i see here again what uh, mr ramesh had mentioned is wearables again so with wearables the opportunity is so huge to convert the sick care that we currently uh, run in or have the format of sick care where only unwell people are looked at and a majority of our healthcare spends is for sick people it's more to well care so that's with wearables where you monitor your health where you have constant constant know how of how you're doing how your trend is how your body is doing where you need the doctor's intervention also only yesterday i read this uh, read this article where it was very interesting but there's a company that is incentivizing your uh, good health in the metaverse and they're giving you these tokens and it was very interesting because it is it is actually flabbergasting that there is so much focus on well care preventive care so again tech and the virtual world now plays a very important role in that so so keeping all this in mind and again coming back to the use of ai and ml in diagnostics i i feel that it is a wonderful opportunity but it has to be looked at with a lens it needs skilled and trained doctors who know the subject and also at the same time understand that piece of ai also in pathology i feel there is lot of work that is being done in the ai seg- segment especially in the analytical phase especially in cytopathology histopathology hematology with automated analyzers and with a lot of oncology testing also in the analytical phase so so we have we have data sets that are created after studying morphologies and then you have ai tools that triage the particular slide or guide the doctor about which slide needs their attention so there's a lot of focus on that but i think one thing that is lacking even in pathology right now probably two things that i i i would say is the pre analytical and the post analytical bit of testing so when you talk about pre analytical and how you can leverage tech there i think covid was a great example of that with ai chatbots that guided you really that the cough you have can be can be covid and if you need a test or how long you have to quarantine yourself or exactly when you need to see a doctor or the tele consultation itself where a, di- a diagnosis is made just by talking to a uh, doctor on zoom or any other platform to the post analytical bit also where understanding reports knowing knowing exactly what are the action points in it when you need to see a doctor when you need to recheck or re- or re- retest yourself something that's very very important again i am going to conclude with a very interesting thought with all of us that see there is something that is that ai provides but it definitely cannot replace the doctor and a very key example of this is something that we have multiple projects going on currently and it's a clinical decision making tool so you take longitudinal data especially in pathology and with basic basic tests like chemistry hematology etc you take this data and then you develop an algorithm that guides you about what should be done in the next months to come so a simple example like diabetes and if you have someone who has a trend where the hba1c is increasing then obviously that algorithm will be able to uh, guess and predict that okay in 4 months from now your glyco levels will be this much so these are the lifestyle changes that you need to undertake so it's more of this well care than sick care that ai and stalwarts in the tech space will guide us towards in the future thank you thank you uh, dr arjun you you provided a, a very uh, strong vision into the future and then the developments in the aml space and also contextualize the challenges uh, and that too uh, giving very lived examples lived experiences so that was fantastic listening to you next i'd go to mr chatterjee 
Uh, sir, Dr. Dang just now spoke about the role of AI, the evolving role of AI ML in technology-driven diagnostics, right. and then and that it improves access, and then there's there has to be some uh, focus on quality as well. So right. my question to you is. Could technology help in improving the quality and access to diagnostic services for population at large, for a country as large as India, and then so much of resource inconsistencies? And what, what changes must happen in this space to facilitate the rapid expansion of tech-driven diagnostics in India? Sure, very valid. In fact, uh, first of all, uh, I thank all the panelists who have spoken so far. Very interesting and very valid inputs, and I think this is the need of the hour. And from uh, it is uh, Health World's point of view, this endeavor to uh, to bring in the diagnostic summit. And diagnostics is not just necessarily a a wing; it's one of the key elements of healthcare. And uh, anything and everything actually evolves and revolves around diagnostics. So you know, um, considering the evolving technology in the healthcare and the way it continues to shape the way we provide care to patients, uh, we have seen the advances in artificial intelligence, data generated by patients using wearables, smartphone technology, involvement of technology in multiple multiple apps, which are uh, the digitized health uh, uh, collaborators of various uh, uh, services and processes which they stand to deliver in improving the. Uh, consumers and also the clinicians' ability to diagnose and treat the patients better. So, you know, as well as it's, while it's improving the quality and the safety of the care is important, what is also more important is to how to build up that efficacy. And uh, of late, even the government of, uh, we, have been, we have been talking about how to make a universal, uh, affordable health care in, in totality made available to people mass across. Now, uh, when it comes to affordability, while you know there can be a price which can be adjusted to the quality, or rather I would say the customer experience, that can come at a price. But when it comes to efficacy of service, that the only way that that price bridge can be can be can be bridged and that can be taken care of is only through improving the technological impact. And when we're talking about a country as as large as India with a uh, 1.3, 1.4 odd billion population and growing, there is no other alternative uh, rather than enabling technology to its, uh, to, to the best benefit by which the clinical diagnostic process and how it can enhance the communication between the patients and the clinicians. You know, to make this structure, when you say accessible across to multiple people uh, across the country, it has five key Key, key drivers which effectively should uh, should make this thing possible you know and uh, well I can just briefly explain to all of them just to kind of simplify it the drivers would be effective teamwork a reliable diagnostic process engaged patients and family members optimizing cognitive performance and robust learning systems now while each of this uh, before I come to the the dimension of briefly speaking on all of the drivers you know uh, one of the key things which also is emerging and that's how probably uh, this is a thought which probably I wanted to share at the ET Health World platform on the Diagnostic Summit right a lot of aggregators and collaborators are existing in the marketplace right a lot of digitized health apps are there which are uh, benefiting through various kind of tie-ups with diagnostic services diagnostic service providers Every diagnostic provider service has a limitation. Now, no matter how much you do, you can never be having a manpower big enough to cover every length and breadth of the country. Two, uh, this effectively the entire system works at a very typical FMCG uh, market domination module where you have areas, markets, routes, beats defined. And the same way our diagnostic processes, the samples are getting collected from the households day after day. Now, there are various few simple but yet key challenges there. When I say simple and yet key challenges, I'm talking about one, the timeliness. Because most of these tests, they require a particular amount of timeline for the sample to be made available at the processing unit. That's one. Two, the holders and the devices in which you are carrying. A subsequent amount of costs on the kind of tubes and kind of... Uh, I'm not getting into too much of detail on the kind of tube compositions, but then with the kind of tubes and the kind of uh, holders which you're carrying in which you're carrying the samples, be it the blood or be it the 
urine or be it anything for that matter, that also defines a lot about the efficacy. Third, and most importantly, uh, at any given point of time, there is an amount of, a, I would say, restlessness or probably a consumer expectation when they want to see things on a real-time basis. You know, and despite of the fact that how many number of SMSs a consumer received, sample picked up, sample dropped, sample given, so while technology has done that bit, but then the consumer equally wants to know what has happened to my sample and so on and so forth. So uh, the entire drive by which this mass effect can be brought in is where probably, you know, I would say the, the diagnostics uh, industry in totality, they need to kind of come together to create some amount of unified uh, units which can be effectively used across organizations, whether it be it a, X A or company or a company B or a company C or a company D, which to a great extent will reduce the cost, enhance the time, and increase the efficiency of the tests. And collectively, it can be a very path-breaking. Uh, and then it, it left upon each to to see what value addition this each of the entities can offer to the customers. And that will be a different kind of a uh, healthy competition where it will be value addition driven rather than somebody worrying. That you know whether my whether my uh, entity A will be a better uh, efficacy uh, giver or probably entity B would be a better efficacy giver. So that's one dimension which I wanted to talk about before I come to the five drivers. Coming back and before I start on the five drivers, you know, uh, diagnostics being the key part of healthcare, and uh, whether it be it the in hospital, outside hospital, uh, preventive, post preventive educative, uh, affirmative, or cognitive. Diagnostic remains the, the cornerstone for uh, connecting each one of them in its own total rights. So very importantly, uh, what it entails is an effective teamwork. And the teamwork refers to an uh, enhanced level of skill and competitions, which are interdependent and also multidisciplinary, which also includes that the patients and families at the same point of time, are equally competent or at least aware about the process that is happening. Similarly, the teams, uh, they can apply safety culture principles and practices which are focused on active engagement of patients, caregivers, uh, making explicit each team member's role and responsibilities in the diagnostic process and therefore reinforcing this expectation through a, throughout patients' oblique the clinical visit, which is the most vital part. In the entire process, one of these key challenges which we need to overcome for a mass level of uh, for a, uh, a re outreach is the skill enhancement of both people and the service provider. It starts from the phlebotomist, lab technicians, uh, the, 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 the clinicians, and effectively the report submitters. And when I say skill enhancement, I'm talking about largely about the kind of competencies which each one would need to hold. Uh, having said that, uh, this is an area where we are still struggling because uh, uh, as we see budding diagnostic centers coming up across the country, particularly into the sub tier uh, one and the tier two markets, uh, a lot of skills often get compromised and uh, our effective uh, control on the mechanisms to ensure that these diagnostic service providers are having the adequate scale level to service those patients. That is something which is a key process which can only help in ensuring a seamless and a effective efficacy level maintained across in the services. My point number two was uh, a reliable diagnostic process. So when I say reliable diagnostic process, I'm talking about the process which describes the system of people and the processes and the environment in which achieving this accurate and timely communicated diagnosis is possible. Because every place when we go, and looking into a country, once again, as fragmented, as different, like India, where probably you have um, varied climatic, humidity, uh, cultural, traffic, multiple things involved. I mean, uh, even we cannot demarket things like a tire one and a tire two. I mean, probably a Hyderabad, Bangalore is a tire one, probably a Delhi and a Mumbai also, also a tire one, and a falls under a metro. But probably to make a movement of four kilometers in a Hyderabad and Bangalore, and the time consumed, besides making a movement in four kilometers in Delhi or a Bangalore, uh, Delhi or a Mumbai, and a time consumed are two very different yardsticks. So, therefore, it is not just about 
the the categorization of the of the areas is also about getting into those micro detailing as to how to enhance those so specifically this also refers to a organizational structures which optimizes the diagnostic safety clinical operations and the workflow so this actually supports the accurate and the timely clinical sample collection information and process that is the only way to ensure that the accessibility to specialty and the expertise derived out of this a uh, significant number of transitions are made useful for the consumer so at the same point of time uh, there has to be mechanisms for patients and their families to provide ongoing feedback about the diagnostic process when i say process this process is differentiated uh, from the word you know by which we say getting information getting information as to selected thermometers it's reached your place sample deposited that's update Uh, but to know about the process, as to you know how the process is happening, what across across the sample management program is, how the diagnostic process, uh, even from the fact that you know pre and post, what have been the changes, smart report to make the patient's life much more easier, so that they don't hover behind uh, only reading behind the the low and the high uh, uh, mean and median marks uh, on the reports. That process needs to be reliably brought up by which uh, the larger kind of fraternity of our customers. they get benefited and they are not uh, mesmerized i would say or they are not confused when they do aspect of just some numbers alone and two these numbers itself are not a indicative of the health of the customer uh, individual having all their parameters under normal but with a subsequent amount of synthesis of their uh, analytics can also derive that you know they are not in the right health conditions so which means a fit person is not a healthy person and vice versa uh, my next point was about engaged patients and their family members so very often which we get to see you know uh, the concern here as a cultural country the way we are very often uh, if anybody is asked that you know how your health is how you are keeping our uh, foremost answers are i'm fine but if the same is asked about your family members whether it be your parents your wife your brother your children defined answers with respect to uh, what is happening wrong or what kind of problems are there uh, the point, uh, highlighting this point is because we are uh, going by our vasu bhakti program which is not only just for our foreigners coming in that's a cultural part where we think that you know ourselves are less important than the people around us are more important that's why uh, the patients and the family members are actually much more concerned so uh, this engaging part engaging patients uh, which are empowered to participate in their care and participate in the decision making process about the goals which are related to the diagnosis pre and post care and the families can also engage at a organizational level through participation in various kind of uh, quality improvement teams wherein uh, somebody can suggest collectively over the point of time wait from a from a block or a district or a area level that what are the challenges collectively they are facing because we have often seen this thing as a occurrence in that you know prevalent diseases occur across in a district level get level where some significant amount of similar cases of diseases originate so this would help us focus towards those centers of diagnostics drive to develop competencies in those kind of tests rather than having uh, an inventory which is always not consumed it's almost like uh, we know what the consumer wants and how we are going to handle this uh, the next point which i had was to talk about optimizing the cognitive performance now when i say uh, this is actually supporting the process of the clinical reasoning which is including the integration of clinical knowledge information derived from the patient or the family members and the care team members and this also includes the effective clinical decision making the educative uh, and the foster clinical expertise in this process what happens uh, when we reach across to a mass level of population there is a pre uh, it is almost kind of a very simple kind of a questionnaire which can also be brought in and then we get a element of data to understand the state or the alertness or the probably the you know the 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 condition or the situation prevalent you know Uh, a family X uh, who probably need for a diagnostic service for some kind of test to be done. 
has an average say you might say you know uh, average life uh, situation which is kind of healthy generally it might have been a reason some happened off late by the virtue of which uh, after reflection for which this diagnosis and the diagnostic test getting a very different kind of uh, i would say uh, 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 irrelevant results uh and uh, which are giving kind of impact factors which are kind of concerning that may not be the state of the family but that can be due to some kind of a situational results which is arising out of it so therefore a pre and a post to come um, to to compound to this helps in the process also once this information goes to the respective consultant or the doctor should make a uh, who is setting up a treatment plan for them it makes their life a lot easier to take the decision on basis of what information they have got what kind of uh, situations which has led to this and therefore uh, the, the 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 next cognitive treatment advices are also at the same point of time much more structured and most importantly is the robust learning systems uh, this is a structure which we need to create within our network of diagnostics all across in the country and this is not something which probably you know the the key diagnostic players in the country should hold on to themselves there has to be a system of transferring knowledge uh, along with the team to support organizational and best practices learning to other diagnostic partners because when it comes to health is not about which is the best in health it's about making sure that everybody has the best health effective way and that to uh, once again you know uh, thanks to this platform who is bringing uh, this entire entire diagnostics arm uh, under the one single umbrella and therefore i'm taking this liberty to address that we should start thinking collectively in a very different manner where we don't this i am building up my organizational best practices just to make sure that i am the best diagnostic service provider in the country uh, there are a lot many things which leads to uh, root cause analysis diagnostic error methods elimination of uh, uh, of uh, of performance so all these things can be improved significantly through uh, measures of uh, creating and retaining the transfer of knowledge and from the learning improvement point of view so see we do on our uh, technological upgradations we continue to enhance upon our reach and access these five should make the core of what this uh, serviceability should offer as a part of its uh, offering uh, i mean technology interventions can target a single driver on a specific but typically we have uh, a way greater impact and effectiveness when they address multiple drivers for example technology that increases patient family and the caregivers access to clinical documentation enhances the quality and significantly the 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 output thank you uh, mr chatterjee when i pose this question to you i was not actually imagining all those dimensions technology usually feels as if there is no human uh, face to it but then what you talked about Uh, is the humanization of technology driven diagnostics so you touched upon uh, socio cultural determinants and you also touched upon a bit of information management behavior management and then moving everyone in a very concerted coherent way so that's how uh, possibly leadership has to look at it when it comes to uh, expanding technology for everyone in the diagnostic space thank you so much uh, i'd now move on to uh, mr chauhan so taking cues from what has just been narrated by the previous speakers what role do you see for technology leaders in building the digital diagnostics ecosystem in india and beyond thank you dr mohapatra and the eminent panel panelists for being me here and and i'm really feeling very proud that uh, you know we are talking about the technology role in diagnostics and technology implementation otherwise if you look at uh, that few years back there was a lot of gap was there between the medicine or in the healthcare system and the technology both were running parallelly but they were not actually meeting well because of covid actually we got to know that is such a large opportunity if both sectors work together can actually transform the healthcare and which actually been proven now 
and through that and we being uh, completely into high end diagnostics if you look at digital pathology was there but the kind of adoption was very poor but during covid if you look at scan the slide send it to the pathologist sitting anywhere in the world get that take his opinion has become so easy so technology adoption has become such an important thing from sample pick up to the delivery of a report earlier trf need to be filled signed and something now they no touch is required just fill up the our uh, phlebotomist just collect the data from the patient directly at the patient home and accessing happens on its own and sample processes so that's something technology has really driven great way the adoption if i look at earlier it was hardly technology adoption was 7% now it is 38% though it peaked almost 56% during april but now it's still at 38% again very big achievement and if we and if we really think about technology adoption very well it can further scale overall healthcare system and and i believe that digitization of healthcare system is uh, divided into three major parts one is the digitization of uh, therapeutics digitization of uh, diagnosis and digital and telemedicine these three major parts it has been divided and when we are talking about diagnosis you know in diagnostics already as dr mahajan has said that uh, radiology was already using lot of technology adoption but still if you look at lot of innovation has come in that area you look at that x ray for drdo actually you remember that drdo also uh, launched one app and then you can get the report immediately through bot reporting same way bot reporting is happening at uh, in fact through colposcopy now same way uh, in fact uh, breast cancer screening started ai and ml has played such an important role that erpr reporting for breast cancer screening can be happen through uh, through ai so i completely echo with that technology has played a very important role but the important thing which need to be resolved or need to be looked at for the future the challenges is uh, interreportability is something where data is the patient information is very well secured in the system or not is the data is very well manageable is that such a standard data as uh, dr deng said that standard data is available and this standard data if the data is very well placed are we really using it well are we using only for ourselves i think that is something where is a big challenge if data is available at one place what is happening at other place is there any integrated healthcare system are we trying to solve not yet lot of new findings dr mahajan is giving every day and lot of new findings other lab or core is giving every day is there any integration of that ct mri plus ngs plus any other molecular based test so that is where i think the future is uh, and and uh, it's a long way to go that now blockchain has come in picture you know and if you talk about blockchain what blockchain is going to solve future is going to be that's what something is too early to talk about but i believe that blockchain is going to be going to help a lot about uh, clinical trials management where data interpretation is going to be much faster much secure decentralized data will be there but patient information will not be leaked which is a, where actually the, the technology leaders is going to help us a lot and second thing is the big data the big data where we are seeing where volume is there velocity is there variety of the data is there is that are we are we managing it well do we have that infrastructure for managing the data that is where area where actually we have outdated technology sometimes we are still making out actually working on outdated tax so that is again an opportunity that we need to increase our it team and maybe more of uh, i'll say and in fact infrastructure need to be reviewed completely because pushing only only reviewing your existing it will not help probably need to think about bringing new technologies in the system is going to be very very important and uh, if we look at uh, data security is one of a major concern where data security if we look at uh, if we can take that very seriously that uh, data security though there are a lot of uh, now uh that uh, rules and regulations been not that stringent so can be used well but still a lot of uh, 
uh, cyber uh, attacks are happening on data and a lot of companies are paying pay, paid a huge about solving that so that is an area which probably tech leaders we need help from that if they can solve these challenges will be will be extremely useful and uh, these are the few major challenges which i look at uh, that that data uh, or, or technology leaders are going to help otherwise i would like to say that because of pandemic we know that uh, human tendency is that we push ourselves best only in difficult situation and which is we have we have proved like dr mahajan said i would like to tell you a small story pcr was probably not aware people were not aware what is pcr today it has become the third most spoken word spoken word actually okay coca cola and then it has become pcr once it was in newspaper only by mistake one big uh, company has put up only get your rt pcr test done that was only technology test name was not there but still people know rt pcr means covid no that's not true so technology has become so adopted okay see in difficult situation it was adopted so well so it is a, so the learning is great opportunity for adoption of technology but we have to scale it up so during covid we have solved it we have seriously solved it we are such a competent country we are but are we going to solve it for other diseases so it is a next step let's take that advantage why we should get into the difficult situation we are sitting on volcano of uh, of diabetes cancer cervical cancer breast cancer many diseases if we can if if we can solve that problem through the learning of those actually our country can become much better what we are doing right now so let's solve these challenges and that is what uh, i would like to conclude thank you so much for inviting me here this is extremely useful discussion thank you mr chauhan you touched upon issues which were not discussed in this uh, uh, webinar yet uh, and of course uh, uh, both like all, all of you have been highlighting that information percolation and that to managing that information the way it is being synthesized by the society the communities is important but uh, of course this is very empowering to the people as well so some buzzwords have come up some tech adaptation has happened adoption has happened and has been happening very rapidly one such empowering element has been highlighted by all of you is of digitization and uh, in diagnostics in uh, remote patient monitoring telemedicine and of course payments uh, i had come to uh, mr ramesh uh, sir you have noted like you you, you are in the uh, leader in this digital payments uh, uh, ecosystem so how do you see this landscape and uh, do you see that it is impacting transformation is it improving proficiency and uh, what what all other attributes have been there uh, through this digitization payments uh, in healthcare i request you to be brief because we are already overshooting timeline sir but of course sure, sure doctor bhatra you know, i i'll i'll keep it brief and as a see the impact of digital payments essentially i'll answer this in two parts one is how are digital payments playing you know a critical role in driving efficiency and scale uh, in the diagnostic industry and how can digital payments act as a facilitator to support new business models right and some of those were discussed right here Uh, by the gentlemen panel speakers so if you look at from driving business efficiency i think uh, as processes go digital manual intervention is minimal this helps in scaling up which we all know and and with a limited addition we can actually uh, scale up and provide more services to a larger uh, set of hospitals um, and so it increases the reach now what we can do is is uh, during the pandemic um, you know and, and we've been very successful in providing many of the diagnostic labs with digital payments the ability to collect a sample and also collect a payment because that's crucial at the end of the day you're offering a service uh, you're a for profit organization you need to be able to collect your money so as to be able to provide the service so we worked with quite a few diagnostic centers um, you know transform their uh, you know operations uh, provide a payment platform so that they could you know collect money for from patients who had to you know do the test whether it be through a simple uh, you know text message that comes to click on it and you make a payment or if you are uh, going to some other test to the diagnostic center you provide a post terminal a point of sale terminal and you can swipe your card and pay from there right? so both ways so whether it's a home visit or you are able to visit the center 
and able to make payments. The second one is, is, is again, to support new business models. And, and I think Dr. Dan talked about it. It's not just about curing sick patients, but also the wellness part. You know, how do you, um, you know, start ensuring that the population as a whole, uh, using wearables and everything, remains more healthy uh, than sick. When it's sick, you know, you have to go get a test done. So this is leading to new business models in the country. There are quite a few startups that Dr. Martin talked about who are working with people to keep them fit and keep them, you know, active, keep them uh, healthy. Um, and, and so those are new business models. And, and th those are areas, again, which are digitally driven. And hence, digital payment collection becomes an important part of the entire ecosystem. So we are able to, uh, you know, provide uh, you know, in both cases, whether it be whether sample collection and testing, uh, pay the, the ability to collect the payments digitally, as well as for the new business models, uh, you have the ability to price yourself correctly and be able to run a sustainable business and collect payments. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Ramesh, for bringing this business model and then startup comment into this digitization discourse. Thank you so much, everyone, for your inputs. Before we conclude, I, I take up this opportunity for one short concluding statement from each of you. Let's start with Dr. Mahajan. Sir, Dr. Mahajan. Uh, thank you very much. I would say that uh, India is poised uh, to become digital uh, with both the private as well as the government sector, uh, you know, jockeying and also working together. And I think the universal health identity that's going to get created is uh, only going to make this easier uh, and uh, uh, transportability of data across these lines will make uh, uh, your life much, much easier, both for the patients as well as for doctors. Thank you, sir. Dr. Dang. So um, technology is critical. And uh, moving forward, um, if we don't really embrace it, we will perish. So being doctors, we should try and understand it, embrace it, and adopt it into our daily life. Because at the end of the day, for the, for the larger cause of the nation, it is the only way that we will deliver high impact uh, health care to the country. Yes, uh, Mr. Chatterjee, your concluding remark. So all I would say that, you know, as we continue this journey of enhancement, upgradation and uh, expansion of our uh, healthcare services and most importantly of our diagnostics vertical and be a significant contributor into our Atma Nirbhar Bharat, which is the Bharat for well-being. Uh, the focus should be maintained on ensuring that technology drives the diagnostics quality improving the connection in between the clinicians and patients and in order to provide a safe, effective and efficient care which should be affordable without compromising upon the efficacy. Mr. Dinesh. So uh, bringing data together to create better impact, better quality of results and, and in fact more coverage to the patient providing all the facilities and in fact looking at other disease segment also to solve the problem of the nation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dinesh. Mr. Ramesh, your control of the mark, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I think digitization is unstoppable. Um, creating platforms that can leverage the digitization to be able to provide services at the massive scale that our country requires is something which is absolutely um, you know, is, it, is it required and, and you know, mandatory. And third, uh, from a private sector perspective, monetization of these platforms that they're able to create and being able to collect payments for the same is equally crucial. Thank you so much, our esteemed panelists. Uh, it's been a very wonderful one hour, very enlightening, very insightful. And we have touched upon several issues. I'd also like to thank our audience for being with us on this. And once again, uh, I take this opportunity to thank one and all, and especially OneLine and ethealthworld.com for bringing this to us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.